Welcome to the Alan Elkan Interviews, an unprecedented window into the minds of some of the most well-known and respected figures of the last 25 years. Natalie Farm and Farmer, we obviously know that you come from the Hewlett Packard family mm -hmm. in America and uh, your father was a banker or mm -hmm. you were raised in Paris. Uh, in Paris first and then uh, when your father moved to another career you went to live in uh, Greenwich, Connecticut, right? So you lived in kind of country houses uh, mm -hmm. in the outskirts of Paris first mm -hmm. and then in the outskirts of New York, mm -hmm. right? That's basically where you had your childhood. But even if your parents had very well furnished homes in a, in a classic way, in Franco, you had way upper class kind mm -hmm. of decor, you studied at Brown University mm -hmm. and uh, you started your life as a journalist somehow because you mm -hmm. worked for the New Yorker and later you were assisting uh, Charlie, Charlie Rose Rose. in his um, interview program, right? Mm -hmm. So why did you become a journalist? I was like many, I guess, women of my class, shall we say, if we're using that word, raised to be educated without ever discussing money and profession. So I actually went and studied Greek and Latin at Brown, and I, I then went to Paris, and I studied at the École des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales, more studying, without ever giving thought about what I wanted to do professionally, what made me happy. I liked literature. I wanted to be connected with the literary world, which I loved. And I fell into it in a passive way, by contrast of what I'm doing now, which is making me so much happier. Yeah, but I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt. Yeah. It's difficult to be passive yeah. in the most important literary mm -hmm. magazine of the United mm -hmm. States and uh, with the most famous interviewer in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes yeah. you could write on the Gazette de Lausanne yeah. and being the assistant of someone. Well, I was an editor. I wasn't a journalist. I was always on the, on the production side. I was an assistant editor, and then same with Charlie Rose. I just... Uh, because you did that for several years, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, you know, my dream job would have been to work for the New York Review of Books and write book reviews, I think. But, you know, if I look back in hindsight, I think that... And did you try? No, I think I was Robert too shy. Did you contact Robert and and the New York Maybe Review? once, maybe once. Maybe I met Rhea Hederman. Maybe I, I tried a little bit, but I was shy. I was much shyer, you know, as a 20-year-old than a 50-year-old. So you didn't go through what you really wanted at the beginning. I mean, this is more of an end of interview thing, but I think I'm much, much happier in the decorative arts. I think that the intellectual satisfaction is the same and I have less anxiety. It's not as competitive. I'm really doing what I want to do, how I want to do it. I like working by myself more than being in a, a competitive atmosphere. You never wanted to be yourself a writer, right? Never, yeah. So what happens? How come from that kind of journalistic mm -hmm. world and milieu mm -hmm. or whatever in New York, you then come to live mm -hmm. in England, in Europe again, mm -hmm. in London, and change your life? Yeah, yeah. Well, and I got married... What made you change your life? Because between interior decorator... I mm -hmm. saw many bookshelves in your mm -hmm. various homes. The decorative arts and the books are not exactly mm -hmm. the same field. Mm -hmm. So how did this conversion happen? No, I think it's several things. I think I was a bit, I don't really know what the English word is, but désabusé. And although I had a very uh, friendly rapport with Charlie Rose, perhaps there was always that in my decor, you know, decoration, was I ever really taken seriously in my work. I mean, I had a, a boss that I loved before at the New Yorker who worked very hard. And there's really no time for mentorship of women, or there wasn't back then. So I think I felt dissatisfied with, with my career. I got married and I was somewhat surprised to find out that my parents were thrilled for me not to work and just make ch you know children. And, you know, they pushed me so hard to be a good student and excel at university. And then here I was saying, actually, I don't want to work. I'm getting married. And 
everybody was thrilled. So that's just sort of an interesting parenthesis on what expectations are of women. But Sometimes it, people get married and work. Yeah, well, I didn't. I took a break. And then that's when I thought completely out of naivete that I was going to make these fabrics that didn't exist. And I was ready. I think I gave myself a few years and then I was really ready to do a new project. And I didn't think of it that I was starting a career at the time. My children were still young. That you had to decorate My own your home. own house, yeah. right? Yeah, so I think that was the catalyst in terms of the challenge. Well, getting married to Amir, who's Iranian, I thought gave me, the, all of a sudden I was plunged into a culture that I didn't know, and I found that very exciting. And so I started learning Farsi. I was looking at all sorts of Iranian art. I really wanted to create a home that would be east and west and reflect the both of us and would be a home for my children where I guess create my own language for my home you know small example my husband had mustache I would always look for toys where the men had facial hair thinking you know it's the thing where it's always a blonde barbie I was like looking for items in the house that would somehow be more reflective of our family in the same time you never really followed the fashion. In other words, mm -hmm. reading about you, we can see that you found your source of inspiration mm -hmm. in several directions mm -hmm. which are different and similar. First of all, you were very interested from the beginning also with a friend of mm -hmm. yours, mm -hmm. David Netta, he says in the introduction mm -hmm. of your book that in Paris you were both very attracted mm -hmm. by work of uh, the famous uh, in between the two wars decorator mm -hmm. Madeleine Castin mm -hmm. and her very special style and a cloth material. But in the same time, you were very interested on the work of the mm -hmm. Russian ballet mm -hmm. and especially in the figure of Leon Baxt, mm -hmm. uh, the famous uh, set and costume mm -hmm. designer. So why were you attracted by that? This was mm -hmm. before your marriage. Mm -hmm. I guess Madame Castan is more, lit you know, she was always a literary decorator and she's nostalgia. It was a sort of a revival, a nostalgic revival, I guess. And maybe we're due again for another period of nostalgic revival. I liked that she was so completely herself in that style and that store was unlike any other store. I mean, I actually never met her. I met the vendeuse there who was also very eccentric. And, uh, you know, things were for sale and not for sale. And I found it really magical and kind of surreal. No, she was certainly very interesting. I met Madeleine mm -hmm. Castan myself, mm -hmm. so I know well the place and her apartment and herself. Mm -hmm. But we were touched by this particular style and by the genius of Bax and mm -hmm. uh, Diaghilev and, and the Russian ballet. Well, all of that is Paris and it's a heyday, you know, it's all a nostalgia for kind of Proustian times in a way, because you have the Ballet Russe, it's the same, you know, it's Paris between the wars. And Madeleine Castin has, is a kind of a revival of this sort of idea of the Maison de Campagne before the wars. To me, it's, there's a link, actually. It, she was hanging out in Montparnasse, and I don't see them as two styles that are so far apart. And I also think her colors were quite bold, Castan. They were bright. There's something quite set designy about her work. Well, what is interesting is that you are interested in Bach's to oh, with yeah. an artist. Yeah. As much as Madeleine Castin, oh, yeah. for instance, was interested in Soutine, mm -hmm. who was a painter and friend, mm -hmm. right? And then lots of Soutine mm -hmm. portraits mm -hmm. of Madeleine Castin. And therefore, as you said, she was uh, friendly with mm -hmm. many of these artists and therefore combined mm -hmm. style also with uh, the art of her contemporaries. Mm -hmm. But Leon Bax was not your yeah. contemporary. No, no, not at all. I mean, you were raised in New York yeah. where there was a pop art, where yeah. all kind of artists and, and different artists. I mean, I did sort of revisit Bax when I looked at Russia after I got married and I started looking at the way Eastern themes were treated by Russian, you know, if it's in music and but basically by the Ballet Russe and I thought that that's so interesting, the way they are looking at Iran in a, such a different way that France and England looks at Iran. 
as a source of inspiration and costumes. And I think they have this form of Orientalism, which is very different than Western Europe. So it's a continuum between the cultures of Asia and their culture and then French culture that they so admired, and they mixed it up in this way. And the way they were mixing cultures was interesting. And you took all this culture, mm -hmm. the Persian culture, mm -hmm. the Russian culture, mm -hmm. the Caucasian mm -hmm. culture, and Paris, mm -hmm. but then you mix it also with mm -hmm. your American background, yeah. right? The background of the, of the quilt, the background mm -hmm. yeah. of the Victorian kind of Anglo-American style. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, what do you do? What is your barbaric... Oh, uh, why is it barbaric? Barbar, what is Decor Barbar producing? Well, I like things that are not clearly defined as one culture. So it is about the borders, I don't want something to look like that this is a Russian fabric or this is an English fabric or I want it to be a mix that works with other things, but then is just, it's like a spice. It's like an element that helps make things a little hard to place or just disturbs a little bit the patterns you would have in a room. But that's what I hope I do. And so what do you like to do? I mean, tell me about some of your achievements. Mm -hmm. What did you decorate for instance, and where that you were particularly proud of? Well, I don't decorate for other people. But you work with decorators. Yeah. I mean, ironically, the thing that make, gives me the most satisfaction, aside from the creative side, is having a business and being able to run everything from A to Z and do things that I thought I would never do, like think of marketing or things like that, which were never at all on my vision and the fact that if you have a business you're always faced with new little challenges and I feel that that has given me so much. I guess that's what I'm most proud of is being able to be creative on the business side as well as the just make fabrics. I'm But not who is buying your fabrics? I would say it's if you look at the top 100 decorator lists, you know, at least more than half of them do, but I can't say so and so buys my fabric because their personal home with it. So I'm not trying to put my stamp on somebody else's house. They buy something from me in order to make what they want to make. So you make a fabric without thinking to the final destination. I mean, I have seen armchairs and yeah. sofas and uh, wool who are decorated with yeah. your own so, textiles and, yeah. and curtains and things like this. You don't care. You do the No, 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 I do care. That I care because it's so easy to make a fabric that I think is beautiful and I sell three cushions and that's that and that's not challenging or interesting. So I do think of a fabric. I think of what I, you know, does it need to exist? So say I'm working on several now. Say some with sunflowers, which is a little bit tacky, the sunflower, and it makes me think of, you know, a little bit of Ukraine, but a little bit of the Hamptons and a little bit chalet. And, a little, and so I think of this theme and how it would be actually applicable in multiple settings that it would be, you know, have this kind of not universality, but that it would give this mood that is just not so, so size specific. And then when you make the fabric, you think, you know, the, the size, you It has to be generally, you do look like at a chair and you see, is it going to be where you have one pattern that really carries the center or is it much? So you have to think of the scale of the fabric and will it work on upholstery or on the curtain, you know, and you match the, the ground cloth with what you think the fabric is going to be used for. And I guess that is just part of the puzzle. Who is making the, the fabrics for you? How do you do that? Well, it's, it's actually it called How an did you editor. Learn to do it? I taught myself, I guess, but starting slow, you learn. And I guess being perfectionist, working with a very good factory. Factory is where? It's in France, in Alsace. And they don't really give any direction, but I can trust the execution. I don't know how I came to do it. Just it came as the more I did it, the better I became really maybe at, at thinking. And I do see, so, you know, it started as a small business. I always look at the invoice that the decorator sends to the showroom so that I see where the decorator is using the fabric. So they will often have a side mark saying curtain, bedspread, or bathroom, you know, vanity or something. So 
that's where it's is I'm having my own little business. I do actually notice every time there is a sale where the decorator is intending to use the fabric. I do make a note so I get a sense of how it's used. And you have a trademark in the sense that once you design mm-hmm. a textile, it is your design. And uh... No, I, I, do, <laughs> I don't trademark them. I don't know if you should put that in the interview because I think it's useless. It's so expensive. And I remember once talking to Allegra Hicks and she said, you know, people copy you and unless you're going to sue them because they copied you and, you know, it's not worth it. So my insurance is that nobody will do it as well as I do it. They want to copy my designs. There's really nothing I can do. I mean, it's just not worth it financially to spend all this money. You have to copyright in the EU and the UK and the US and all of that. They can tweak a branch and do a little something and say, I was also inspired by the sunflowers and whatnot. So at the moment you are inspired by sunflowers. Well, that's one thing. What yeah. other things have inspired you? Well, I have this old scarf and I'm doing these more crazy, these are more, I see them as very festive, multicolored, so they'll be hard to do fabrics. I'm making two of them. And so I see them as like a fair, like something a little, almost a little gaudy, but that has a lot of detail. And maybe that's a more oozy fabric. I'm not sure that people will like it, but it's, let's say it's, it's harder sell than the Ukraine one. But there's nothing like it, so that's why I'm doing it. I try to do things that don't exist, because otherwise there would be no point. You also put together old fabrics mm-hmm. and new fabrics. Yeah. How do you do your research? Oh, I have so many books. I mean, I, and I do look, like right now I'm going to do probably collaboration with someone who does incredible wovens. So there's so many wovens in the world, and I'm thinking, well, what, I take out my decorating books and I have a lot of fashion books actually. And I think, you know, what is there that doesn't exist and and how would I create a fabric that needs to be there that's not already there? I'm thinking of that and I take everything out and I look at it again, you know. And it's funny because some things are in my head already. 20 years ago, I ripped this page out and didn't know that I would do something with it. And I still like that fabric and If I could buy it, I would buy it, but it's not doesn't it's not there anymore or something like that. Fabrics have always existed or mm-hmm. have a very long history, right? Mm-hmm. But do you think that in the world of today who still like as much fabrics or would like to cover the walls with fabrics or Well, I think those are two separate things. Would they like to cover their walls? Yes, but it's expensive and the manda the price of using fabrics has gone up because you just don't have the workforce that, you know, people used to have on their street, someone who could cover a chair. Now you really have, you know, you have to fight in New York for the good people and you have to be on a waiting list to get someone something properly done. So it's not really given to everybody to be able to do that. But whether people like fabrics, I am shocked that there's not a single person who doesn't like fabrics. I mean, I think it's like a fundamental material of human life and art and it's like having a puppy have you saying you're a fabric designer I mean immediately people are like oh you know like they connect to fabric and they all have a story about fabric and I think fabric maybe it's one of the oldest art forms with pottery I mean it's like part of our common human history and uh, you have to do with carpets too or? no but I'd love to do carpets yeah because yeah. carpets are another very, very old yeah. tradition, yeah. right? Yeah. Because you cover the floor, yeah. you cover the yeah. wall, you cover yeah. the table, you cover the bed. Yeah. No, people love fabrics, I think. I don't know how we got into this beige moment, but... But do you think people get tired? The fabric is very overwhelming wherever it is. It can be on a table, it can be on a bed, it can be on a wall. Well, that's why the English do it so well, because actually the more... You have, and if you do things in a kind of eclectic collector way, kind of Christopher Gibby style, then you're never tired because you can always move this to there and that, which you can't really do in French decor. You know, the room is kind of done, but in the sort of very eclectic style, I don't think you tire. Actually, my house changes all the time because I get something new and I put what was there over there and there. And I find that 
the more detail and stuff you have, actually the easier it is to add more pattern to it. But if you have a very clean beige room, everything is a statement that you add to it. Whereas you could put a carpet in my house and nobody would even notice there was something new. People spend a lot of money on uh, decor today. Now we live in a moment which is uh, special, right? Mm -hmm. Normally, isn't it more a a kind of an Anglo-Saxon fashion or style to use decoration, to use uh, textiles and curtains and... It seems to me that it has a lot to do with the Anglo-American style. You're completely right. The decorating business is an Anglo-American phenomenon, maybe even an American phenomenon. Say Nancy Lancaster was American, actually. So that kind of energy and wanting the middleman and having the way the business is run is probably American. But that's true of so many things that America has set the tempo for the way we live. Yeah, but in the same time, we can see that in Paris, we mm-hmm. had periods, decorators, yeah. no? We had... Uh, they don't like to spend as much, the French. Than they do in America. Yeah. But they probably have less money. Yeah, yeah. And what about the rest of the world? I mean, the whole world speaks about the Far East. Uh, there will be probably very little fashion business going on mm-hmm. without China nowadays. What about these people? Are they interested in your work? I mean, Asian people, Japanese people. We have taken a lot of Iranian, Indian, Chinese into our world. Mm -hmm. Your combination of elements, Mm -hmm. is it attractive? Is it interesting for these countries who are so interested in what we do here in Mm. in the Western world? in terms of luxury, yeah. fashion, elegance? I mean, I'm so such a small niche product, but I am you know, sensitive to cultural appropriation and, and those kind of issues around design. And I have gotten so many touching Instagram. I mean, I had just like two days ago, a woman in Bucharest said, I was able to find your book. I can't believe... I was able to find your book and thank, you know, so they actually, I don't think that they have the decorating business or all that, but I think they're proud that someone is inspired, but, you know, I don't know if they will decorate their homes, but they're very happy that the appreciation and the, to change the center of gravity on aesthetics a little bit and look at other cultures and what they do is interesting for them. I mean, it's really too complicated an issue. I mean, the only country that I know well outside of, the West is Iran and, you know... Iran is in Iran. nowadays is not a country. Yeah, it's so sad, you know, and, you know, apparently I'm huge in Mashhad. I have all these Iranian, you know, they're just so happy to see, brings tears to my eyes, you know, it just makes them proud that someone is using Iran and liking their fabrics. And so obviously you don't sell them in Iran. No, I don't. I don't think it would work really there either. I mean, I mean the way you are dressed today... <laughs> You apply the same principles to your way of dressing. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> this mixture of uh, styles yeah. and colors and uh, yeah. textile. Patterns, yeah. Are you creating your own patterns for your own clothes? I would love to do clothes, but I'm really glad I'm not in fashion. It would be too stressful. I really like being in a business where you can take your time and if you, you're not sort of beholden to an industry and a speed and, and you But know. you probably talk a lot to decorators, no? I mean, yeah. You have to see them. Mm-hmm. And uh, what do they want today? Are they seeing a change? You know, I mean, we have seen over the years many different mm-hmm. changes. We went from Castin to Jarsen yeah. to minimalist to now the this fashion of yeah. the, which is probably maybe finishing of the French furniture mm-hmm. after sure. the war. Yeah. Nobody wants old uh, antiques anymore, but they may come back. I mean, what do they say? What is the tendency? I think the client has now the ability through the internet and Pinterest to know Before, nobody knew who Monjardino was. Nobody had been in a room. You know, nobody could even imagine this. And now, on the internet, you see all sorts of styles, all sorts of things. And so the decorators, in a way, have to respond to the demand from the client. Now, 
often it's very confusing because the client wants, you know, one Radzivill room and one Monchardina room and one, you know, they want all these things and they don't put together. That's why I think that small brands like ours, where there's a story and there's someone who has like a cohesive aesthetic that relates to them, which is sort of why I wrote the book as well, is like try and find what is your aesthetic from your things that you love and the life that you've lived. And you take everything, all that noise and all those images, and you can actually, if it's things that you like and relate to you, it'll go and it'll be your style. So I think that's really new to have this cacophony of of visuals and possibilities. You said the decoration was mostly American. Mm -hmm. uh, You spoke to types also of Mm -hmm. places, no? There are country houses Mm -hmm. and there are city houses or apartments, Mm -hmm. right? But that's circumstance. I kind of had to do with what I had in terms of locations. Those are only my homes really in the book. It's not anybody else's home. So two of those homes are my mother's house. So So if you have to give a definition, you you were a well-educated young woman, then you worked in the world of, let's say, media for some time, mm-hmm. you changed to decoration. How would you describe yourself today? I don't know why I'm finding that question so hard. I travel through, uh, sort of a visual traveler. I, I like thinking like of step cultures, and I read a book about just Indo-European. So I travel through things visually, and I try to then bring something back and put it in a fabric. And is London a good place for this kind of work? I mean, is Mm. it inspiring? And the fact that this is uh, such a multi-ethnical city with a tradition of people going and coming Mm -hmm. from far away, travelers, is it giving you specific inspiration? I don't know if it is at the moment, but I think almost all decorating now is our really babies of the English style, of that global collector that you you have in England, that English decorating. And so living here has exposed me more to it, I suppose. And unfortunately, the Pimlico Road is no longer what it used to be. It's, it's kind of over. Some of it is kind of over, but it is a dynamic city and it has great home decor publications and people care about it. You talk about the English and you have a Russian inspiration mm-hmm. French inspiration, yeah. and uh, you know, also in Italy, I believe there is a great interest. Yeah. And you mentioned Monjardino, mm-hmm. but there are other, many others who are not only interested in design, yeah. but they, are, they design all over the world. Mm-hmm. They decorate homes. Mm-hmm. They came, they so they kind of came to Italy on their grand tours. I mean, they had this kind of take a little bit from everywhere approach to decorating, which is maybe very 21st century, really. So you're pleased with your book, you're pleased with your work. What are the new projects you have in mind? As I said, I'm going to work on some wovens. I also want to work on um, traveling more, both for business and also just for discovering new things. And I want to keep ahead of the digital media and, and see about videos and how, again, how to communicate beyond just with Instagram. So I'm curious about that. What do you want to communicate? A style? Your style? Yes. So we go back to the question, what is your style? It's romantic a little bit outside of the bounds of the familiar. I think the colors that I have are like a little bit brighter. I want things to look like they've always existed. I mean, you know what that that means, right? Yeah. In an mm-hmm. established order, you create disorder, right? You bring something mm-hmm. new and, and then it becomes something else, right? The first person to use the word barbarian was Herodotus. And in his description of the peoples, who actually is one of my favorite authors, Herodotus. So he describes all the peoples around Greece, you know, and I love ethnography, essentially. So they're all, you know, the, the Scythians and the polar people, and they're all strange people that do everything upside down and whatever. But barbarian is initially just a non-Greek. Someone who doesn't speak Greek is a barbarian. And then it has a very negative connotation. But that's always seen from the center. So I see it as meaning the other. The barbarian is just the other. So you are the other. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. 
looking for a little bit of disruption, perhaps. Yeah. Well, that's Which what, in itself becomes a style. Yeah. Yeah. Are there any rules that one has to keep in mind? Definitely no rules, but. Because the patchwork can be very interesting or very corny and mm -hmm. uh, fastidious. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. You know, it's like a bouquet of flowers. They can match together or not match unless you want to disturb. Yes, I, I think mean, I'd like to do that. When one comes into a room of yours, let's say where the decorator has used your mm -hmm. material, your uh, clothes, what do you want that I feel? You want to, me to feel comfortable? You want me to feel uncomfortable? You want me to no, feel I think interesting. cozy? You want me to feel inspired? Mm -hmm. What do you want? And do you want to create a shock? In other words, that I come into your room and I am amazed or not? No, I don't like shock. I mean, first of all, I'm not someone that likes to shock at all. I do try to say, if I decorate myself, I, I do try to say maybe let's, and this is something that I've learned actually from looking at Central Asian robes and costumes and how they put patterns together that we would never do and how beautiful it looks, or say two patterns that are the same, but we would never use both colorways, but let's use both colorways. So I do try to, in my own decorating, do things almost on purpose, like, you can't do that? Well, I wonder if I could. But I do hope that my fabrics are elegant. I hope that the... What is elegant? Well, I think that they would be interesting, but I guess that's why I don't want the fabrics to shock. I don't know, because a lot of it is so intuitive. I focus on myself and what I think, what I like, and, you know, some people use my fabrics, they'll put it in review, and the result is hideous, you know? I mean, I can't control what the fabric looks like in the end destination and how it's used. But I hope that the person, it's beautifully made, the colors are beautiful, it's evocative of travel, and sophistication in the sense that the methods of printing and colors are all really 19th century and you know I hopefully there would be a little bit of refinement I guess elegance would be that you said that you were a small business mm -hmm. and that you thoroughly enjoy at 360 mm -hmm. degrees the idea yeah, of running yeah. a business yeah. from A to Z yeah. What is your ambition? You want to become a big business or you want to keep yourself a small business? My ambition is to be perfectly run but not grow too big. So it's actually very difficult to go from small to just a little bit bigger because then you have to manage people. So I'd like to do more collaborations so I do more of the creative work and keep my own business as small as can be, really. You may want to work for... I don't know if they still exist, but for Abrahams and make a line of... Uh, yeah, exactly. A uh, line of this, a line of that, but keep my own business quite small because I just don't want that many people in my when life. When you say small, how many you it's, are? It's just me. And then I have like three people that I work remotely with, but that are not in my office. And you yeah. have many projects in your hands at the moment? I have a few, but I am uh, finding it hard to move past this COVID, you know. With, COVID yeah. has been a big problem for you? In terms of doing something new, not in terms of the existing business. It's been fine. If people stay more at home. Maybe they want to think more about decoration or not. Yeah, I think it'll be good long term for the decorating business, I think, for sure. But I'm just one in a long pipeline. You know, you need atelier to make sofas and, you know, I can ship out my fabric, but... They're not doing it. They are actually... It's, things are pretty much retaken all over. But if there's more, say, if COVID climbs more in California and the people can't go to work, then they, everything will stop for two, three months. You know, so it's definitely disruptive, especially for big decorators that were my main clients. They often had projects... All around the world and they can't go see their projects they can't see their clients they can't install it became a passion for you i think it's maybe too strong a passion how do the ideas come into your mind the drawing no i have ideas all the time what i look for is for things that come back so some some say the sunflower fabric i had that idea maybe four years ago but 
I wait to see if I really think it's, that's the way I can see if it's a good idea. Yeah, because otherwise I could, if, if, you know, if it was free and I buy like old fabrics, I mean, I could make a fabric a day, but I need the discipline to, I can only make, I afford to make so many. And I have How to many do you make? Well, I make about four, four a year, maybe new ones. Yeah. And how many you have made until now? Maybe 35. 35? Yeah. yeah. How many years have you been doing this? Well, I started a long time ago, but really five on my own. Yeah. So good luck. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Alan L. Can interviews.